Hi everyone, welcome back. My name is Matt Jarbo. This is, of course, Deep Lore, and I feel like I've been gone for longer than a minute. I apologize. I know every podcast host says that when they return from a hiatus, but I was spending time building up the website, trying to get the social media going, and really trying to pick a story to kick off the rebirth of the show in a way that is going to probably bring a lot of attention. But I also wanted it to be somewhat... um personal to an extent, because when I talk about Pizzagate, I was one of the first people to really kind of call it out for what it is, to call it a load of crap back in early December or late November 2016. And when that happened, I was completely attacked by people who watched my old YouTube channel because they believed it was real. They wanted to believe it was real. It was being pushed by every Tom, Dick, and idiot out there. And it all came to a head a few weeks later when a man stormed into Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria with a gun trying to find a completely fictional child sex dungeon. So as we dive into the episode, please remember that uh, this is completely true. And it really does go to show you that even in the last six, coming up on seven years, the far reaches of fringe conspiracy theorists, as well as I'm just going to be political throughout this whole thing, right wing nut jobs. A lot of people haven't moved on from this. They still believe that this is real, just like that Wayfair scandal from like 2020, where people tried to claim that Wayfair was, you know, involved in sex trafficking. I mean, this is the kind of craziness that we're dealing with. And so why don't we dive in to Pizzagate? Because it is a very uniquely interesting part of our American culture in the past couple years. And it's something that needs to be talked about more. So first, let's ask the question, what is Pizzagate? The Pizzagate conspiracy theory emerged during the 2016 United States presidential election cycle, a period of heightened political tension and partisanship, a central event that played a significant role in the origins of Pizzagate was the hacking of John Podesta's personal email account in March of 2016. Podesta was the campaign chair for Hillary Clinton, and his emails were subsequently published by WikiLeaks in November of 2016. Proponents of the Pizzagate conspiracy theory falsely claimed that these emails contained coded messages linking several high-ranking Democratic officials and U.S. restaurants to an alleged human trafficking and child sex ring, and one of the establishments falsely implicated was the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria in Washington, D.C. When I first heard of this, I will fully admit I was surfing around 4chan's poll board. If you know anything about that, it's kind of a cesspool for political commentary. It's really just terrible people discussing terrible things. But I was using it at a time to create content for my old YouTube channel. I was really trying to see what they were talking about to kind of see what like the fringe, what they had their fingers on the pulse of that entire base. And I don't know why I was trying to court them at the time. It was very stupid of me to do, but I was. And that's where I came across this specific theory. It was originally shown to me as a 40 some odd page PDF you know, with all the typical red arrows and underscored pictures and things like that, trying to really showcase that this whole thing was some huge pedophile sex ring led by John Podesta and his brother and Hillary Clinton and that Seth Rich had been murdered because he uncovered all this and everything else that was going on. And I'm like looking at this going, this is complete bullshit. This is completely a lie. This isn't real. This is straight up like just it's fiction. It's absolute fiction. But people really wanted to believe this. And believe it or not, the conspiracy theory was propagated by members of the alt-right at the time when the alt-right was starting to gain prominence, right? We have conservative journalists uh, and individuals who had called for Hillary Clinton's prosecution over her use of the email server, which even that has largely turned up nothing. Donald Trump wanted to lock her up. Donald Trump had four years to get his goons to find something to bring charges against Hillary Clinton and chose not to do it because there's nothing there 
that is really that interesting. It's not the same thing as what he's going through right now. You know, the 37 counts of uh, somewhat of the Espionage Act and the Presidential Records Act that Donald Trump is currently facing in, in, in uh, you know, Florida. Now, I'm not trying to make this a Donald Trump bashing thing. I'm just trying to kind of tie it into where we currently find ourselves in the current political climate. Now, what we have to remember is that these outlets, these alt-right outlets, were largely groups of individuals that were spreading it on places like 4chan, 8chan, Reddit, and Twitter. And these were their primary platforms for dissemination. And the reason why these platforms worked is they were all freaking anonymous. They were absolutely anonymous. There was no way to know where this stuff was coming from. But because it had that weird kind of tinge of realism, a lot of people started to believe that this was something that was really happening. Now, at the time, notable figures involved in promoting the theory included alt-right activists like Mike Cernovich, who, if you don't know who Mike Cernovich is, especially if you're kind of a normie to the situation, the best way to describe him is he is the guy that ultimately got James Gunn fired from Disney back in July of 2018. He was the guy who published the tweets that James Gunn had posted from 2012, 2011, 2012, somewhere in there that ended up costing him his job. Now, it's funny because here it is five years later and James Gunn is now running DC Studios and having put out one of the biggest comic book movies of the year. So, you know, it's not like it's all been bad for James Gunn, but that's largely who Mike Cernovich is. And I'll fully admit, I platformed him back in 2014 when I didn't know who he was. This is back during a very controversial time in my own past involving Gamergate. And I feel really bad about that because I wish I, I kind of caught on that this guy was a scam artist, but you know, when you're caught up in the moment, you're caught up in the moment, there's no excuse for it, but it's, you can see how, like when you're trying to fight back against this supposed invisible enemy, anyone that's got maybe a platform or an angle or, you know, a personality can end up being brought in very, very easily. Cernovich was like a lawyer. And that's why he was brought in on Gamergate because he had the law on his side. He understood the law and could offer up explanations that a lot of people who were just gamers didn't understand. Little did we know he's just a whack job and he really is. But not only was it Mike Cernovich, you had people like Brittany Pettibone and that is a whole other can of worms, whole other can of worms on who that lady is. If I recall correctly, she married like this, like insane right winger, full on white nationalist from Europe. I think she's been like denied reentry to the U.S. I think I'm not too sure. Uh, again, not a good person. And then you have Jack Posobiec, who's still around doing his nonsense. Jack Posobiec is the guy. Here's a, here's what you need to know about this guy. He's also a faker. He's also a scam artist. His original kind of claim to fame was he wrote a Game of Thrones blog before he got into this alt-right nonsense. But when he tried running some, you know, making some move for, for relevance within the alt-right, him and a crazy-ass woman named Laura Loomer, like, staged some protest at a play. They got booted. And as soon as they were booted, they already had a GoFundMe put up. But my personal favorite, and this is what I recall, I just want to say this is what I recall happening, is that Jack Posobiec led a counter-Trump protest that was largely a false flag. Again, this is what I remember being told to me, where one side, they were protesting Trump uh, with one sign, but on the back of the sign facing the audience was a sign that said rape Melania that got a lot of attention as being, you know, the quote-unquote intolerant left trying to target uh, the upcoming first lady, Melania Trump. Again, everything that comes out of this group of people are really, really just psychos. And even, you know, Notch, Marcus Pearson, the guy who created Minecraft even got in on this. And to the point, even now, Mar you know, he's he made a billion dollars selling uh, Minecraft to, to, to Microsoft. And, and he's largely just been on Twitter ever since. And, and I think even now he's kind of effed off a little bit, but I haven't, I haven't looked into him much recently. But when we talk about the origins and the key players of the Pizzagate conspiracy theory, 
This highlights the potent combination of not only political tension, misinformation, and quite frankly, the power of social media platforms in propagating baseless allegations. If you guys recall the whole Russiagate scandal, you know, we did find out that Russia's internet research agency was very active in pushing false information through Facebook and Twitter, and in my personal opinion, YouTube, over the course of that time period in order to influence a lot of the current agenda that was happening at that time. Now, I don't have any evidence on the YouTube side of things, but you can look to see how things were with Twitter and with Facebook, and YouTube's algorithm largely operates very similarly. So it only makes sense that like Google would have been targeted, but yet for some reason, Google was never brought up in any of the conversations. Now, that might be my own little tinfoil here, but I'll fully admit that. But it was the misuse of real events, like the WikiLeaks publication of the Podesta emails, that added a veneer of credibility to the unfounded claims, allowing the conspiracy theory to gain traction despite its lack of grounding with any factual evidence. You know, it's really, really fascinating when you look at that original document and you look to see how far down the rabbit hole whoever put it together went trying to create this cohesive narrative that under any scrutiny just simply fell apart. But let's talk a little bit here about the spread of the controversy. So the theory itself started to gain traction on Twitter when an account posting white supremacist material falsely claimed that it was the New York City Police Department that had discovered a pedophilia ring linked to members of the Democratic Party while searching through Anthony Weiner's emails back on October 30th, 2016. And if you know anything about Anthony Weiner, that guy's insane. Now, let's talk about the spread of the conspiracy. So the theory itself started to gain traction when a Twitter account that was largely known for posting white supremacist material falsely claimed that the NYPD had discovered a pedophilia ring linked to members of the Democratic Party while searching through Anthony Weiner's emails on October 30th, 2016. That same account falsely stated that Comic Ping Pong, a pizzeria in Washington, D.C., was a meeting ground for satanic ritual abuse. And it was then that this false information started to circulate more widely on social media platforms and was eventually picked up by fake news websites. The thing you have to remember about this is that the guy who was in charge, the guy who owns Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria, James Elephantis, they literally tried to claim that this guy was like the 43rd most powerful man in Washington, D.C., a pizzeria owner who happened to host a lot of fundraisers for Democrats. That part is true. And has a bit of a, you know, odd sense of humor. And he's a weird guy. He's a weird guy. But they tried finding everything that they could with him and the Podestas. And there's some weird shit in there. There's this whole thing with like um, a, a, a woman who got into like some blood painting. Like, I think her name was like Maria Abramovich or something. And she had some weird art that these guys might have been into. And that was another factor. And it was all of these circumstantial things that people were largely trying to feed into this machine to spit out this narrative. Anyway, one of the first websites to publish this theory was a site called Your Newswire. And they were absolutely fake news. They were always a hoax website. I saw it get spread around quite a bit. Remember, when I was doing my old YouTube stuff, I like to cover the weird stories. I like to find the weirder, odder tales around the internet. But back then, and even now you have like, you know, you have like Babylon B and you've got the onion and other things like that, that put up these satirical articles. But back then your newswire, as well as many other publications never established that it was fake news. And so it really made its way around. In fact, they cited 4chan from earlier in 2016 as a way to kind of validate this rumor. The Your Newswire article was then subsequently spread by pro-Trump websites, including subjectpolitics.com, which added the false claim that the NYPD had, in fact, raided Hillary Clinton's property. The conservative Daily Post ran a headline claiming 
that the Federal Bureau of Investigation had confirmed the conspiracy theory, further fueling its spread and acceptance among certain groups. Now, this is pre-QAnon. And again, we can start to see this stuff really, really, really making its way through social media. I started noticing this everywhere, not just on 4chan, but I would see it on Facebook. I would see it on Twitter. I was really involved in the coverage of this from the this is bullshit angle, but I started to see it pop up everywhere. I started to get people coming at me and telling me that I was just covering for the deep state. I started noticing a lot of other swindlers coming out and really trying to push this thing as being real all while they tried to sell gold and, and other crypto bits or things along those lines that they were able to use to make money. It became its own cottage industry. But then the allegations reached the mainstream internet just a few days before the 2016 presidential election after a Reddit user posted a Pizzagate evidence document. That's what I'm talking about, which I saw after the election, but it was a couple days. I'm My memory is a little fuzzy on the specific days I saw all this stuff because all that content I put out was it's all gone now, but it was right around that same time. Now, the original Reddit post, which was removed somewhere between November 4th and November 21st, alleged the involvement of Comic Ping Pong and made a series of baseless allegations against the business and its associates. And that was what I originally had read. They had like Instagram photos that they were trying to like pin on this. They had a bunch of crazy stuff that they were trying to, to connect this and that and the other. And it just, it none of it seemed rational. None of it seemed logical. Why would this small pizzeria in the middle of Washington, D.C., that just normally hosts fundraisers and also like, you know, some weird musical choices, band choices, I'll admit that. Why would they have an underground child sex dungeon? Just simply made no sense. And then we started seeing some like videos come out from underneath Comet Ping Pong. There was one that allegedly showed kids in cages. You heard children crying for help. You had people travel down to Washington, D.C. with cameras walking around Comic Ping Pong, trying to find an entryway into the underground, trying to see if they had a basement, trying to do all these things. None of it ever amounted to anything. But the spread and the evolution of the conspiracy very much highlighted the ways in which misinformation can quickly spread across different platforms. And it evolved and it grew more complex as more and more people just started adding layers and layers of falsehoods. So many lies, so many made up things. It was like one of the worst games of telephone I had ever seen on the internet. Each person adding another layer to the lie, but then also people believing that each crazier layer was real, was accurate. And that like, this was all a deep state thing and that the government was covering it up and that none of it mattered. You know, like it was all, they were lying to you and everything else. But due to a lack of any credible evidence, the conspiracy theory was able to thrive due to a combination of confirmation bias, cognitive dissonance, and the speed of this false information and how fast it can spread on social media. Never mind the exploitation of existing political divisions. This was the 2016 presidential election. This shit was crazy. This was wild. Political tempers were at an all time high. I mean, they stayed there for about four years, culminating, in my opinion, with the Jan 6 attack on our Capitol. When that insurrection happened, you can tie that back to Pizzagate very, very clearly in regards to this type of nonsense being picked up by people who would consider themselves MAGA. But then it came to a head. And even this didn't stop the nonsense online, but it did quell a little bit of it because there was an attack on Comic Ping Pong by a man named Edgar Welch. The Pizzagate conspiracy theory inspired a man by the name of Edgar Madison Welch to take matters into his own hands. At the time, he was 28 years old and he was from Salisbury, North Carolina. Welch spent a lot of time online. 
and was deeply affected by the claims he found about this supposed child sex trafficking ring operating out of the basement of Comic Ping Pong Pizzeria. And so he felt compelled to quote unquote self investigate and also potentially rescue the non existent victims. It was at the height of this where he believed that he had to do this. He had to self investigate. He had to get to the bottom of this. He had to quote unquote save those kids. So he chose to act. On December 4th, 2016, Edgar Welch made the journey from North Carolina to Washington, D.C., armed with an AR-15 style rifle, a 38 caliber Colt revolver, and a folding knife. His intention was to liberate the children he believed were being held captive in the basement of Comet Ping Pong. This, of course, as I pointed out, was fueled by the baseless Pizzagate conspiracy theory. And when he arrived at the pizzeria, he immediately began searching the premises. When he went inside the restaurant, it was an absolute scene of fear and confusion. Patrons and staff completely unaware of the online conspiracy theory were now confronted with an armed man combing through the establishment. During his search, he fired three shots inside the pizzeria. One bullet damaged a computer tower, another hit a lock, but thankfully, no one inside was physically harmed by the incident. Remember, he went in there trying to find this quote-unquote underground child sex trafficking dungeon in a building that, by all accounts and even public record, showed had no basement. So when he got in there, his investigation turned up no evidence of human trafficking. No hidden tunnels, no hidden rooms, and finding himself in a place far different than what he had ultimately envisioned. And it was after that that he did peacefully surrender to the police. Imagine that. Imagine you are so worked up by what you read online. You are angry and you're upset and your blood is boiling and you think that children are being harmed and you have this physical guttural reaction to the news and you just want to go and save them. So you grab a couple guns and you drive to Washington, DC, you fire off a couple shots thinking you're going to scare everybody out. You're going to shoot the lock off a door. You're going to go down and you're going to rescue the kids. Like you're starring in a freaking Arnold Schwarzenegger movie from the eighties. And you find that there's nothing there. I mean, just th think about like a world shattering moment in his life, a world shattering moment. I mean, like, it's crazy. Edgar Welch was arrested and charged and sentenced to four years in federal prison. Once he was released from prison in an interview with the New York Times, he did express regret over his actions, saying, I just wanted to do some good and went about it the wrong way. The image painted by the conspiracy theory was so vivid and so horrifying that Welch actually recalled the heartbreaking thought over innocent people suffering. And even after his fruitless search of comic ping pong, he could not completely dismiss the possibility of a Clinton connected child sex ring. His belief had been so firmly entrenched that he was only able to say that there were no children inside that dwelling. So he believed it so wholeheartedly, so fervently that even when he was faced with, with the truth of it not being the thing, he couldn't let himself believe it. He couldn't let himself see the light, if you will. It's crazy. Now, his attack ultimately brought Pizzagate into the mainstream spotlight, and it did heighten the risk of misinformation and false claims on the internet. And for his actions, Welch did face punishment and spent those years in prison. And now he's out and largely just wants to live under the radar. In fact, even a lot of people in his own city weren't even really aware of what happened. But the internet always remembers, to be fair. So there's that. But now we get to the part of the story that I find to be the most cathartic. Because all of this stuff... All of these things, it stemmed from a few people, the misinformation being spread by a number of individuals, 
most of whom will never, ever, ever have to say anything to apologize or take accountability for the lies that they spread. But this is where we get to Alex Jones, because Alex Jones had, for the most part, been talking about this. You know, Alex Jones's Infowars had put up videos saying Pizzagate was real, but then later on changed the title of the videos and then even took the videos down. They were one of the main proponents for pushing the conspiracy theory on YouTube because back in the fall of 2016, Alex Jones had not been pulled from the platform yet. And that was when he had millions of viewers, millions of subs. And this was a way for this controversy to reach peak impact with that type of audience. And if you know anything about what happened with Alex Jones and the Sandy Hook parents, you know that that provocation can lead to some people doing some stupid shit. So following the attack on Comic Ping Pong Pizzeria, the public response to Pizzagate did become more serious. With many recognizing that real world dangers such as unfounded stories could provoke someone to do something. One significant event in the aftermath of the incident was actually an apology issued by Alex Jones through Infowars because his far-right media outlet had helped spread the theory. Jones, like I said, was a vocal proponent of Pizzagate, and ultimately he was forced to retract his statements due to a legal threat from James Elephantis, who was the owner of Comic Ping Pong. This is like really the only apology that James Elephantis was able to get. And it's funny because this happened on March 24th, 2017, many years before Jones was found guilty or liable for the, was it almost $1 billion in fines for uh, defamation against the parents of the Sandy Hook kids. So this was like kicking off that particular thing, I think a little bit. So Jones issued a public apology to James Elephantis for his role in spreading the theory, stating, I made comments about Mr. Elephantis that in hindsight, I regret and for which I apologize to him. This was interesting because it marked a very rare instance of Alex Jones walking back previous statements and was seen as an acknowledgement of the potential harm caused by the propagation of these unfounded conspiracy theories. What's really funny is just like two months later, he was forced to do the same thing again after he had made comments about Chobani yogurt and their operations out of Idaho, like in some of the comments that he had made surrounding them hiring uh, immigrant employees. And I think he called them like very derogatory terms, essentially not based on race, but like implying that they're all sexual predators essentially. And he was also met with a threat. And then he also backed down and retracted his statements, but you guys got to understand by that point, it doesn't even matter by that point. It doesn't matter at all. Like it's already out there. His audience is already going to see it. They're not going to see the, the apologies necessarily. But anyway, look, the legal threat and Jones's apology did underscore the serious implications of promoting these theories. Not only do they highlight the potential for violence as evidenced by the actions of Edgar M. Welch, but they also brought attention to the reputational damage suffered by those implicated in these unfounded narratives. For Alephantis and Comic Ping Pong, the Pizzagate theory had led to significant distresses and danger transforming their lives and their businesses. And that's a hundred percent accurate. You can not like James Elephantis all you want. You can not like Comet Ping Pong all you want. You can think all these things, but the people who responded and the people who like called and, and, and made threats online, like this was all shit that really did put a massive target on their back. And it almost resulted in that being something that could have been fatal. But despite these responses, the Pizzagate theory didn't entirely disappear. You figured it kind of would, but it didn't. In fact, it served as a precursor to the QAnon conspiracy theory, which began getting traction on 8chan in 2017. While this was now less focused on the Clintons, QAnon maintained the central premise of a global elite 
involved child sex trafficking ring. Showing the persistence and evolution of these unfounded narratives, even in the face of substantial debunking and public condemnations, mean nothing. There's a documentary called Into the Storm. It's on HBO Max or Max now. And the filmmaker in that goes through QAnon, largely breaks down what it is, largely calls it out for what it is, and ultimately kind of exposes it for what it is, which is bullshit. But even just the other day, I happen to be at Costco getting gas. I look over and I see this guy with a where we go one, we go all bumper sticker. And I'm just like, they're still out there, guys. They're still out there because it's really hard to change a belief. You can change an opinion. But when somebody fervently, deeply, intimately believes something like this, it's going to be so difficult to change things up. Now, look, the spread of Pizzagate and its influence on QAnon did overall really highlight how important these trends and these issues are. They demonstrate that the power of the Internet and social media can work really, really, really well in spreading misinformation and these conspiracy theories. And it doesn't matter that there's no credible evidence to support the claims. All they need is a theory that's able to gain a substantial following and even inspire. All they need is a theory that can gain substantial followings on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and TikTok and wherever. And it's entirely possible that they'll inspire real world actions due to the fact that they are not challenged on these social media platforms enough to disseminate them into irrelevance. And that's why I wanted to talk about Pizzagate because it's been thoroughly debunked time and time and time and time again. But the way that people out there look at it is through this lens of like, well, it happened once. I don't think it will happen again. We're kind of more aware of it now. And the truth of the matter is, folks, I don't believe that. Because I see how fast information spreads still. I see how much of it is still largely bullshit. I mean, again, to kind of just get a little political here. I mean, look at the fact that Donald Trump has been credibly charged with 37 counts ranging from, you know, the Presidential Records Act to the Espionage Act for legitimately taking documents. And he knows he's screwed. Now, whether or not he goes to jail, I have no idea. But he comes out there and he just rants and he raves all this nonsense and his audience, they eat it up. They, they eat it up like it's Christmas dinner. And yet, it's so difficult to break through to those people. And you, you see this kind of stuff pop up online, especially in little pockets. I'll, I'll leave you guys with, with a little anecdote, if you will. One of the guys who used to work for Alex Jones was a guy named Paul Joseph Watson, who sucks. But back in like 2015, 2016, he wrote about a trend on Twitter that was called pissing for feminism. And the idea was that women who had been victims of sexual assault would lose control of their bladder during this event because of how traumatic it was. And that, so women online who were feminists or they were allies, whatever, they could show solidarity by pissing themselves and taking pictures and posting it on social media. He ran with that story that it was happening on social media. It was a 4chan hoax. It never happened. He ran with the information 4chan posted, acting like it was real. 4chan posted the information in hopes that it would go viral to then push women to urinate themselves and then take selfies to stand in solidarity with victims of sexual assault. And even when presented with the fact that he had been duped by 4chan, he didn't care. Because deep down, none of these people care. You can see this largely in right-wing media that's based not in facts, but it's based in emotion and it's based in fear. And, and that's something that needs to be looked at. So to, to kind of end this segment, I just simply say, if it seems too good to be true, it largely is. That goes for both, you know, promises made 
and shit you read on the internet. But that's always where I want to get your guys' thoughts on this as well, because I like a good conspiracy theory. You know, one of the only ones I kind of jokingly let myself believe is that Jeffrey Epstein's still alive, that they faked his death to get him out of there. That's, that's, it's a fun one. It is what it is. He's probably dead, but whatever. So it's always good to kind of approach these things from critical perspectives. And as always, I want to hear your thoughts, your opinions. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify or Google podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, please find a way to leave a review. You guys can head over to deeplore.tv to get uh, this article that I put together, or you can find other articles. We post at least one article a day. You guys can get that over there as well as uh, Twitter, Deep Lore TV, Instagram, Deep Lore TV, TikTok, Deep Lore TV. It's kind of Google it. You'll find it. I will talk to you guys next week again. Thank you all so much for listening. Have yourself a wonderful day, a wonderful week. And always be wary of what you read on the internet because it's not always true. It's usually full of shit. I'll see you guys.